Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of We Are Being Transformed. This is contrary to popular opinion and rumor, not a Transformers podcast. This is a podcast where we discuss the myriad of ways in which people, both in antiquity and in uh, the everyday uh, world, are transformed and mold their culture into new and exciting things. And uh, that includes literature, it includes ritual, it includes cult, magic, all that stuff. Um, and uh, joining us today, I have the great honor of welcoming, welcoming um, Dr. Timothy Whitmarsh, who is someone who knows a thing or two about the topic we're discussing tonight, which is the Greek novel. So Dr. Whitmarsh, how are you doing? Uh, very well, thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. The honor's all ours. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about um, this phenomena that's kind of ubiquitous for a few centuries in the uh, antique Greco-Roman world, which is the Greek novel. Now, I want to preface this by saying that um, novel, like any other kind of label, whether it be like Neoplatonism, Second Sophistic, Gnostic, etc., cetera, uh, these are terms that they didn't use at the time. They weren't self-designations, but the, for the sake of brevity and simplicity, we will call it a novel. So Dr. Whitmarsh, can you give us a brief rundown of what the Greek novel is? What drove its popularity? Well, there are two different questions, obviously. I mean, what the Greek novel is, what we conventionally mean by the Greek novel is one of five texts that are um, extended fictional narratives dealing with young love, essentially, girl and boy, heterosexual young love, girl and boy fall in love at the beginning. They either get married at the beginning or get married at the end, but marriage is, is important to the, the dynamics of the narrative. Uh, and then they have some sort of separation uh, and they have to, if you like, prove the enduring quality of their love through that separation with all the trials that come with that separation, including love rivals, um, uh, ship, shipwrecks that kind of thing but at the end they get back together again and uh, there is a sort of implicit happily ever after to them that's the basic structure of the Greek novel but as you could imagine it's a literary form and there are all sorts of ways of twisting it and playing with it so whilst that description of it sounds a little bit sort of boring and earnest and as if it's socially programmatic and focused on the heterosexualization of the young and the uh, the normative role of marriage and all that sort of thing there are all sorts of subversive undercurrents in it that test out the limits of that ideology, if you like. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. Um, so I guess getting back to the second part of that question uh, I was asking, <laughs> what exactly drove its popularity at that time? What was it about them that made them so uh, appealing? This is a really interesting question. The novel seems to be new to the Roman Empire. Uh, we have maybe a little bit, you know, a few traces of things that might be called, if you squint at them, might be called novels in the uh, the period before the so-called Hellenistic period. But really, our first Greek novel, uh, as uh, uh, as I defined Greek novels then, appears in the mid first century AD, and it seems to be a big hit. It seems to be that it spawns many imitators. It um, uh, it, is, it influences many other genres other than the Greek novel itself. Uh, so our first text is Caraton to Calaroe, which is an absolutely amazing text um, for a number of reasons. One of them is that it's female-centered. The figure Calaroe, the uh, figure of the title, is uh, uh, endures domestic violence, um, is uh, left for dead, is kidnapped by slavers, is sold into slavery, um, contemplates the termination of her pregnancy, um, and um, by the end of the novel, um, she's had a, such an extraordinary array of really damaging life experiences, uh, but she's reunited with her husband, the former domestic abuser, at the end, and brought back to Sicily, which is her home island, and at the end of it, you get this very weird mismatch between her experience and his experience, because he's asked to tell the story of what happens, 
what what's happened so far and he stands up in the assembly of, in front of all of the um citizens of syracuse the city on sicily the, where they've they've reunited and he tells the story as he understands it but of course he doesn't know the full story he doesn't know calaroya's side of it there are things that she's kept from him including what happened to their child uh, for example uh, which is palmed off as someone else's child um so it's a really strange novel that that centers female experience it really gives all of the narrative energy and this the emotional sympathy to the the woman and leaves the the the, the male figure as a rather sort of useless and um also morally problematic side figure so why is a text like that so fascinating in the roman empire i mean at one level it's got to do with the Roman Empire as space. These are, as I mentioned earlier, the, the travel narratives. People move around space an awful lot. These are texts also that themselves circulate around space an awful lot. We know that we can see them um, traveling around the Roman Empire with you know, papyri found here and there and the like. So they, they are about describing a bigger space, a bigger canvas of action, if you like, even though Calaroe, the text I was just talking about then, is set. Um, 500 years earlier in the time of classical Athens it's it really is a, a, a text that's about the experience of being within the Roman Empire and all of that that language of the, those scenes of enslavement and the like they use Roman imperial language to describe the the, the fact of enslavement and the uh, the legal status of the slave and the like so they do seem to be about um, the mobility of the Roman Empire the interconnectedness of the Roman Empire and the ugly side of things like people trafficking in the Roman Empire. Uh, at the same time, whilst they've got this sort of expansive imperial vision, I think what we see in the Roman Empire generally is the creation of a, if you like, a sort of Newtonian counter-reaction to that desire to move outwards, is a desire to move inwards into the self. So there's an awful lot of interior monologue in a text like Calaroe, when she's contemplating what she will do in all these sort of crisis situations, awful situations where she doesn't know what to do. She's got an unborn baby on the way. She's got um, pressures from, you know, this guy who wants to marry her. And she's still in love with her ex-husband um, for, uh, for all that he's done to her. Um, all of these pressures playing on her. But you get this sort of this calculation inside. She's having to weigh up all of these different feelings. So, um, so it's about... It's, interior space as well it's about the the um the desire in this era to have a more reflective approach to to life to have to understand what your options are better to to analyze those options um to give space to the emotions that conflicts play out uh, in your mind so yes, I would say it's, that's what makes them popular at this time. They really speak to the Roman experience of space as simultaneously expanded and contracted. Well said, well said. Thank you for that answer. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I think not just back then, but I think even now, like when I read Cariton, like back in college so many years ago, like a millennia ago, um, that's what struck me, just like the interior... Uh, pathos that was going on with Clearaway and just the gravity of her uh, decisions that she had to make and and but but despite all that and knowing probably what we know about the woman and her place in the society at this point in time she's very defiant in the face of like all these decisions that are thrust upon her and that's what always constantly um grabbed me about her story. Um, I think another thing that you mentioned in there that I just wanted to touch upon before we get to the next question is um, you mentioned how you know, the male protagonists like Kyrius and uh, later we'll see, you know, Clitophon, they're, they're, they're basically useless. They're unreliable narrators. <laughs> they're, they're, um, they're the ones telling the story, but I think even throughout all that, you can see like who the real heroes and heroines are in a sense. Uh, and that's what I really love about these stories. And I think really with uh, Carrie Ton uh, laying that foundation, that's probably, um, he saw some, uh, somebody like Achilles Tatius saw like missed opportunities that he would exploit in his later work. And I think he did that quite masterfully, but we will get there. <laughs> um, so, you know, I guess going along with the question of how why were these so well received i think 
is tied another question overall, which is um, highly polarized, but we have to touch upon it. Um, and I know this is really highly debated in scholarship and always has been. Um, but if we could just generally posit an answer or just I'm asking maybe your irresponsible speculation on this. Um, who was the audience for the Greek novel? I, I would say that, I mean, alongside the Greek novels, we have a lot of other fictional narrative literature of this uh, era. And the there's clearly a widespread desire amongst all strata of society for um, fictional, exciting fictional um, narratives. And um, even the illiterate presumably had ways of accessing this kind of material through, I mean, in the medieval period, we know of reading groups, for example. So you only need one literate person to be able to, 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 to tell a story. I mean, the prime example of a popular novel is the so-called Alexander Romance, which is a fictionalized version of the life of Alexander, which we have. Um, it's anonymous, which is a, a good sign of it being a popular text because um, um, elite texts tend to be linked to a particular author because they they have ambition and, and the, the, author, the author is trying to get kudos, if you like, by being remembered by posterity. Uh, the Alexander Romance is anonymous. It circulates in multiple different forms in antiquity. It's translated into many different languages already in antiquity and increasingly into the Middle Ages and beyond. It has all the whole hallmarks of a popular text that would be enjoyed by all sections of society. So I, I think we need to remember that there is, in a, in a, in a world in which literacy is growing in, and in, in which the opportunities for access to texts um, is growing and in which we've increasingly got a sort of cultural homogenization, I mean, within very large limits, um, but you do get a sense of a, a common Greco-Roman culture over a, a wide space. The texts, popular narrative texts do spread to a, a very large uh, audience. And there are other examples of that. There are the, the so-called ass narrative, the most famous version of this is Apuleius's Golden Ass or Metamorphoses, which is a, a high status literary text, but it's a sort of translation into a high status elite text of a popular tale um, of which we have another version from antiquity. There is the so-called Life of Aesop as well, which is a, uh, a tale about the famous fabulist, the composer of fables, Aesop, who is a slave in this version. He's enslaved and he runs rings around his master. He's much cleverer than his master, although his master is a philosopher. Um, Aesop is the real kind of narrative energy. So it's a comic tale of subversive um, energy from below, if you like. So a lot of popular literature. The novels that I was talking about, the romance novels, one of them, the romance of Xenophon of Ephesus, has strong popular elements to it. The other ones I think we can fairly safely say, say are um, uh, heading towards the elite and most of them certainly in the elite sphere. And you can map this out by things like literary illusion. Uh, the minute we start having um, complex allusions to works of classical literature. It doesn't rule out the possibility that, that a wide spectrum of people would have enjoyed them, but we know that amongst the readership, amongst the intended readership, must have been pretty, people who were pretty educated. And education means money, obviously. Right, absolutely. I mean, if if you're participating in any kind of paideia, there's significant resources involved there. That's just no question. If people think student loans and all that are bad today, yeah, like, yes. nothing on antique. Idea. Um, but yes, thank you for that answer. That was amazing. Um, I think another thing that uh, just really strikes me about these texts is um, we were talking. You were talking earlier about how they conceptualize space, inner and outer space, right? Um, so you have like you know the changing of a world. You have these people. Pretty much, we tend to romanticize it. Like I know in the classics, there's this like sense of romanticizing like what Hellenization and the Roman Empire did. This wasn't just like imbuing culture in a romantic sense. This was like subjugation. This was mm, like, yep. yeah, yeah. So, um, and so people are trying to make sense of that in a changing world. Um, 
also like the interior um, is changing as well. And that's something that I just, like you said, Kerry Tom kind of, he lays the blueprint, but you know, you see people like later, like, uh, like you were saying uh, with Achilles Tatius or somebody like uh, um, Xenophon, they really, they play with that. Yeah, I think you really uh, touched upon that in your text, uh, narrative and identity in the Greek novel. Um, when I read that quite a while ago, um, but uh, that's probably a, a, another can of worms we can discuss another time. But um, but yeah, I wanted to uh, point out something to general audiences that they aren't exposed enough to, um, and it's that not the Greek novel is in its ascendancy at this time, but there's also another genre. I don't know if you want to call it genre, but there's a, there's another kind of form of literature that's kind of growing, and that's the gospel and acts literature. And this is so mm -hmm. much that P. Reardon has probably um, argued in his um, collected ancient Greek novels uh, edition that um, the acts literature even should be considered part of that kind of um, world. But um, you know, it's they're both growing at the same time, both share similar motifs. You know. Maybe you can't prove genetic links, but this is more speaking to you know the what people are enjoying in their literature mm -hmm. and what they want to read and what they want to hear about. So both have these similar motifs. You have lots of shipwrecks, lots of empty tombs, mm -hmm. crucifixions, uh, lots of resurrections and an epiphany. Yes. Strangely enough, especially in uh, Calero, it, it's all over the place. They're always like, "Oh, she looks just like you know the, the goddess." Um, so I just you know and and the trial is especially popular no matter what type of literature you're reading back then everybody like seemed to love that like you go anywhere from Apuleius's Apologia to you know any of the five canonical Greek novel texts like the the trial is the center of the text and strangely enough it's the center of the gospels as well so um, I was wondering if you could discuss these motifs uh, not may maybe necessarily in regards to the gospels but maybe adjacently to what these motifs are found, uh, what kind of motifs are found in the Greek novels, and um, mm. why are the striking similarities there creating such a stir in people? So there are two ways of explaining it, aren't there? One is that both early Christian literature and the novels respond independently to the same kind of forces, and the other is that there is some sort of connection between the two and that one form is influenced by the other. Um, to think about the first first, I mean, I mentioned the the role of uh, sort of an, uh, the, the Roman imperial conception of expanded space, simultaneously creating a space for in, interior space. And obviously one can map the emergence of Christianity into that kind of scheme if you want to. Uh, the um, the Acts of the Apostles, but also the letters of Paul um, already detail you know, the creation of a huge network of Christian communities, which is sort of translocal. It doesn't exist in one space. It actually exists in the network between these different communities. Uh, and at the same time, what these communities are being uh, asked to do is to look after the lives, the interior lives of, of, of people in the communities. So it's about being interconnected in the space of the Roman Empire and at the same time about focusing on the self and and um, the management of the self and the appetites, needs, desires, whatever of individuals. So there are all sorts of ways in which structurally the Greek novel emerges in step, in lockstep with uh, early Christianity. But I think there are also strong indications that what we see in the Roman Empire is a very fluid sharing of ideas and resources and themes between large groups of people. We have to remember that we don't have the, the Christians over there and everyone else over there, even though a certain amount of Christian literature pretends that, <laughs> that you know, these two groups are sort of, um, you know, live in different places. But um, there's been great work done by um, Eric Rebiar at Cornell, amongst other people, um, just showing that, you know, that's a bit of a fiction, actually, that Christians are sort of the same people as uh, pagans in the Greco-Roman world. And indeed, often, you know, Christians are worshipping other gods as well simultaneously. So there's um, an awful lot of of mingling um, between Christians and non-Christians and blurring of the edges as well. 
So when you get in Achilles Tatius, for example, I mean, he's writing in the, I think the 130s, some people say the 170s, um, but 130s, um, so sort of quite early for the development of Christian literature, but he has this scene where Dionysus invents wine and gives it to uh, humanity uh, in the beginning of book two, and it's said to be a sort of a, a charter myth for uh, a Phoenician uh, ritual around Dionysus, but uh, he gives the grape to the um, the farmer and says, um, take this, this is the um, blood of the vine. Uh, and it's so much like Jesus at the Last Supper. It's almost exactly the same language, Jesus um, giving the, uh, the Last Supper to the disciples. Dionysus and Jesus are often interlinked um, and you know, people go both ways with that. Some people say that the gospel texts themselves have Dionysiac elements in them. But that sort of idea that Jesus and Dionysus work in similar sorts of worlds, they're both sort of gods of the afterlife, they're both gods of salvation, they're both gods of transforming water into wine, as, as um, in John's gospel. So, you right. know, there were all sorts of ways in which the-, Sorry, the I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just gonna say, uh, yeah, I read an article by uh, a scholar named Courtney Friesen yeah. Who, um, yeah, he, he's the one who went through book two of Leucopy and Clitophon and, and transposed it with Mark. And I was very convinced by his arguments. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's yeah, definitely no, I think there's that, things going on there. Yeah. Yeah. And it works the other way as well. I mean, the Greek novels center on these sort of stories of endurance over time and, um, you know, uh, the lovers display their commitment to each other despite all the hurdles that go on. And these, these narrative motifs are sort of transported out of the Greek novel into Christian hagiography, uh, where, of course, it's not erotic devotion to the other that is being performed, but it's, um, you know, pious devotion to God. But it's the same set of motifs and the same language and the same sort of narrative pattern. So the Greek novel immediately, with its, you know, success in one sphere, bleeds out into the Christian sphere as well. Amazing. Thank you for that answer. Yeah, I was. I think the only thing I have to add to that is um, just going back to the previous two questions about why these things were so compelling and who the audiences were. Um, I was talking to a scholar named Ed Watts, Edward Watts, about um, yep. Paideia and about, you know, just what, you know, when you're writing, when these el cultural elites are writing, like somebody like Lucian is expecting you, if you're in that same kind of cultural vein to understand these references. And it goes both ways, like you were saying, like Lucian's true story is lifting things wholesale from Book of Revelation, Apocalypse of Peter, all that stuff. And he's like mixing it all together. This isn't just like some insulated world where people are vac hermetically sealed from each other. They're all borrowing and they're all interacting. And I think it's important to realize that. Um, so yes, thank you again for that answer, Dr. Dr. Whitmarsh. Um, I think my final question is going to tie into, uh, you know, we touched upon the gospel and Acts literature. Um, and oh yeah, that actually Neil cut here. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I want to add this because uh, I was talking to Dennis McDonald last night, and we were talking about um, Dennis is really big on um, parallels between the gospels and Greek tragedy and poetry and things like that too. Um, you know, as a result of that paideia and. Uh, I think when we were in the midst of talking, I, I mentioned that Mark to me seems how Mark transforms his source material. It's kind of like, I just picture Mark as like the, the author of Mark is this guy who was really optimistic and then 70 AD happens and then he reads Cariton, he's really depressed and he basically creates the Empire Strikes Back of the Synoptic Gospels. It's very, if you read Mark in its original context, it's like, subversive biography and um, all of these things. And it's just very striking how earthy and, and, and weird it is. Um, mm. But yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, uh, so my last question is going to deal with another aspect of the language and the motifs of the day. Um, we talked about Christians and pagan literature borrowing from each other and interacting in this dynamic cultural exchange. Um, when I read Leucopian Clitophon and other of the romance novels, I find a lot of mystery cult terminology. Mm. Lovers are telete, 
seduction is a mysterion you know this this in addition to the obvious death rebirth initiation motifs you have phoenix motifs in there as well um, in your commentary on book one and two of Luke P. and Clitophon, you mentioned um, an author I've never read, um, but I find his theory fascinating, Merkel Bach. Um, he argued that the novels were rooted in the worship of deities and mystery cults. I was just wondering if you find any credence to this, if you have any further thoughts. Yeah, well, he's on the shelf up there somewhere. Merkel, he's probably actually behind me somewhere, immediately behind me, but I won't find him now. Um, it's, yeah, uh, so... I think most scholars would say that Merkelbach's views are overstated. I mean, he really does think that the novels have a sort of two-level structure, that they have a a, a superficial level for non-acolytes who can read them in the way that you and I read them as narrative uh, adventure stories. Uh, and then there's a deeper level, which speaks to the experience of initiates into the mystery cults, um, at which level all of these stories of um you know uh, challenge to, uh, and um you know adversity and descent into dark places or whatever take on a more mystical meaning and the, the problem with it is that it's a a sort of conspiracy theorist version of <laughs> of a reading strategy essentially what you do is you start seeing patterns everywhere and then once you start seeing, seeing patterns you have to join them up and then you know it um the, but the point is that, I mean, as you quite rightly say, there are uh, pointers in this direction. There are bits in the novels that look like they are speaking with the language of mystery cults and allegory and the like. And we know that in this era, there are authors who are reading myths and other stories allegorically and trying to... to um, transpose them into more religious registers, but apparently secular stories trying to read them in more uh, religious ways. So I think the, probably the best way of understanding the, the religiosity of the novels is not to see them necessarily as sort of liturgical documents in the way that Merkelbach saw them, but more to see them as as um, as using this as part of the the, the texture of the the narratives themselves. I mean, as, as we were saying earlier, they're terribly as absorbent, these texts. They take magpie-like, take all sorts of things from all sorts of areas of culture at the time, including from these philosophers who are beginning to read allegorically and trying to want sort of deeper meanings or whatever. Doesn't mean that there are deeper meanings in the text, but there are, they they, they borrow, they're, they're amongst the elements that they borrow. Amazing, thank you for that. Yeah, um, I think, you know, ultimately, um, we need to nuance any kind of view that we have of like, there's just one intended reader for these. There, there are multiple readers for all of these, and we can all enjoy them on uh, different uh, planes of uh, their existence. Um, and this is the final point I wanted to make, um, just to ask your quick opinion on this. Um, but one thing my channel seeks to do is to take all of these texts and understand them all together on their own terms. We don't need to understand, like say the gospels as something unique from say Plutarch or vice versa. We, we need to understand that these are all existing in, in the same kind of cultural matrix and enjoy them and respect them on those terms. And uh, even including things like the Greek magical papyri. Like um, I was having this, a discussion with a scholar about the Greek magical papyri and I asked him, I go, well, what is so important about these texts ultimately? He's like, well, because when we read them, no matter how alien they are, they're, we're looking at ourselves. And it's the same thing with these novels where we're looking at ourselves and um, we still get some kind of value out of them. So I was wondering if you could maybe succinctly uh, sum up why somebody in 2023 should pick up a pick up Carryton or pick up, you know, an Ephesian tale, something like that. Um, why in 2023 we should do that? Well, I mean, they are uh, phenomenally sophisticated texts that give you a really 
um, I mean, they give you an insight into just how lively and dynamic the conversation was in that era, but they also speak to us now. I mean, uh, Liu Kipping Clytophon, for example, that you mentioned there, the second century text, uh, I think is the earliest example in Greek of a text that's about resistance to arranged marriage, for example. I mean, it is um, really, so the lovers, are within the same household, they're cousins, uh, they're both, well, the, the male is due to be married to someone else uh, at his father's will, um, the girl is being chaperoned and kept off on her own as, as girls were at the time, and they fall in love and they elope um, scandalously against the parents' will, but by the end of the novel, when they've proved their love to each other, the parents kind of come around. The parents say, yeah, um, that that's, you know, we'll, 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 it's great to have you back, you know, and the, so the young love wins out. So it's really quite extraordinarily, I mean, to use your word, transformative moment in human culture when uh, you go from basically a view of love, which is about sort of um, what adult males uh, want to impose on others, to a much more reciprocal, symmetrical version of love. Of course, it's not entirely symmetrical. And of course, these are elite people that we're talking about and not everyone has the same opportunities. But in a sense, you know, the celebration of youthful passion as sort of more valid than what the parents want to do is a really profound, subversive moment in human culture, which still speaks to us today. It's the language of pop songs and um, the language of, you know, um, teen movies of the 1950s and the like. Um, and there's no, that that is not an accident either because the novels themselves were rediscovered in the 16th century and fed into European culture via Shakespeare and Sydney and the like and became sort of influential on stories like um, Romeo and Juliet or whatever that have exerted a long-standing influence on the way that we perceive um, uh, erotics in the modern era. So, so I think they're hugely important cultural documents that remain vital, energetic, and highly readable today. Well said, thank you for that. So Dr. Dr. Whitmarsh, um, if there's anything you want to plug, please feel free. This has been an absolute honor for me. So um, any books, any anything you're working on now, um, feel free to use this space to promote. Well, I'll just uh, add one thing there, which is that uh, since about 2014, a bunch of us in Cambridge have been trying to, uh, so the Greek novel has, has now become a very established field and a lot of people are working in it. But that was the result of long labor, essentially, and by people like Brian Reardon, who you mentioned there, who produced that collection of translations of the, the Greek novels. Um, we've been trying to do that with late Greek epic poetry as well, which I, I think is, um, I mean, there are, the people working in this field, really important scholars working in this field, but it hasn't really sort of hit the, you know, the the public in quite the same way. So we're trying to produce a new set of translations of the late Greek uh, epic poems as well, uh, and hopefully that will have some sort of transformative effect itself when when that comes out. Love it, love it. I'll be on the lookout for that for sure. Um, <clears throat> so, Dr. Whitmarsh, thank you once again for joining us. You have an amazing evening. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Thanks very much, Jason, and thanks for having me on the show. Thank you.